Professor Walid Faez. He serves as an advisor to the Anti-Terrorism Caucus in the U.S. House of Representatives is a co-secretary general of the Transatlantic Legislative Group on Counterterrorism, a Euro-American caucus since, 19, since 2009. Dr. Fares briefs and testifies to the U.S. Congress, the European Parliament, and the United Nations Security Council on matters related to international security and the Middle East conflict. He consults with and lectures to several national security and defense agencies as well as counterterrorism advisory boards in North America and Europe. He has served on the advisory board of the Task Force on Future Terrorism for the Department of Homeland Security 2006-07, as well as on the advisory task force on nuclear terrorism 2007. He teaches global strategies at the National Defense University since 2006. Previously, he was a professor of Middle East Studies and Comparative Politics at Florida Atlantic University. He has published several books in English, Arabic, and French, including the latest three post-9-11 volumes, Future Jihad, Terrorist Strategies Against the West, the War of Ideas, Jihadism Against Democracy, and The Confrontation, Winning the War Against Future Jihad. His most recent timely book, published December of last year, is The Coming Revolution, Struggle for Freedom in the Middle East, which has projected the uprising in the region before they occur. Dr. Fares is a Fox News Channel Middle East and terrorism expert. He has served as NBC terrorism analyst until 2006, and he appears on international and Arab media and is published widely. Welcome and thank you. I'd like to thank the Institute for extending the invitation and thank you for coordinating. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, what I would like to try to do in, again, eight minutes is to answer or try to answer two questions. The first one is, is there a link, historical link, between 9-11, between the event that we are you know, commemorating this week, and the Arab Spring, um, which I tried to establish the base of in, in, in my latest book. And second question, an attempt to an early identification of the forces of the Arab Spring. Uh, so because I, I do argue that the Arab Spring is not monolithic. It is multi-dimensional. It has multiple forces. And therefore, a good approach to the understanding of these forces could give us some, some notion of how to project. I would never use the term predict, but project uh, events into the, into the future. As we heard from historians and, uh, of course, uh, serious analysts on, on, on the issue, uh, what preceded what I call the genome of the Arab Spring in the 20th century and specifically in the decade before 9-11 are two significant uh, dynamics that are very revealing with regard to what caused the Arab Spring or the forces that were successful in at least overthrowing the regimes all kinds of regimes, pro-American regimes, anti-American regimes, regimes in between. First of all, a quick look at the 20th century. We would see that under British and French mandates, and then post-1945, throughout the Cold War, under the Arab League regime, at least for the Arab countries, the same forces that actually organized and rose in the Arab Spring have tried to do so before. The same forces, for example, if you look at Egypt, you have the Muslim Brotherhood tried many times to have a spring or to have a coup or to have a, a change in Egypt and they were harshly repressed. They became experts in being repressed and therefore are now the experts in penetrating societies and uh, uh, having a long-term resistance against the suppression of governments. Liberal forces are not new. Individuals, authors who have tried in the Arab world to play the you know, reformist card. We have the writings, we have tons of books and articles. So these forces are not new. This is a new generation of these forces. But what we conclude with here, first point, that in the 20th century, despite those attempts on both uh, sides, the Islamist and the non-Islamist, they were not successful. One of the reasons, plenty of reasons, but one of the reasons was the fact that there was a Cold War. And in a Cold War, everything is frozen outside the Cold War, meaning neither the Soviet Union nor the, you know, the NATO or the Western bloc have been really significantly interested in having changes that would go against their immediate interests. The Soviets wanted their own regimes to stay as such. So in Syria, for example, they did back the Assad regime, the Ba'ath regime, against all the uprisings which were uh, organized by the Muslim Brotherhood at the time. And in pro-Western countries, the United States and the international coalition of the U.S. were interested in keeping those regimes 
versus even the liberals or the Muslim Brotherhood or others. Then the Cold War ended. The same parameters continued in the 90s, the pre-9-11 decade and post-Cold War decade, which were the 90s. Those same forces tried again. In some cases, they were a little bit more successful, but yet were not able to achieve what was achieved since January of 2011. It's because of many other reasons, including almost the same reason, one of which was stability. U.S. foreign policy, Western foreign policy is, was in the region oil uh, inclined. So any major change in those countries, and by the way, the same United States, when there were threats on behalf of the Muslim Brotherhood against the Mubarak regime or Bin Ali or others, you know, had the same position that we stick with our allies. So that brings us to 9 11. What did change basically in 9 11? Not the actual forces, the international context, the alignment of planets on the one hand. And on the other hand, of course, the tools. What was not there before 9-11, or at least the same time period, was the massive rise of internet, of communications. And let's not forget, that brought about a lot of dynamics to those who wanted to rise. 9-11 by itself didn't have an impact. What followed 9-11, in my sense, the Western intervention in the region, similarly to the story of Western intervention in the late 19th century in the region, had some consequences, effects. And if you visit quickly, uh, first was the downfall of the Taliban, that's at the edge of the Middle East. But what came after the Taliban, sociologically speaking, was instead of one Islamist authoritarian regime, you had multiple political parties. You have a very mediocre democracy, obviously, and a lot of uh, <coughs> you know, mismanagement by the government. But put this on the side, what the public has been seeing in Afghanistan is the fact that you can have multiple voices, you can have debates. That was the first message that was sent. The second message, probably more important, despite our debate in Washington about uh, you know, the Iraq invasion, that's something else, what came after the Iraq invasion was the fact that instead of one Ba'ath party, there were 120 political parties, most of which were not really democratic, but the fact that there were parliaments and there were messaging, you know, and there were uh, different uh, kind of political expressions, and more important probably, 120 newsletters, publications, satellite TV, the ambiance in the region has changed, definitely after the fall of Saddam Hussein. And that communicate to other societies, to the segments in other societies, both the Islamists, but also the liberals and the democratic uh, forces, some sort of energy. First thought, which basically was, I, I consider, the an, one of the ancestors of civil society moving, regardless of the regional context, was Beirut, the Cedars Revolution, 2005. The SMS revolution, where 1.5 million people, and that's not an armed movement or a small size demonstration, that's almost the entire government or the entire society moving. And the result of that was the departure of the Syrian army of Lebanon. It did not end the problem in Lebanon, Hezbollah is still armed in Lebanon, but it's the actual Syrian revolution that inspired others, again, via internet, via Facebook, via YouTube at the time. Two years later, or actually four years later, June of 2009, for the first time ever since 1979, this is significant, 1.5 million people demonstrated in the streets of Tehran, the Green Revolution. Now, it, it was not successful, that is not the issue. What it did, basically, Beirut and, and Tehran sent a message to others. How do we know? By reading simply online resources. How Arab performers and Arab Facebookers started to say, well, look, it was possible to put one million people, and that cannot be ignored, and we could actually do the same. But the Islamists also looked at the same phenomenon. So now quickly, Tunisia, Egypt, and the rest of the Arab countries that in, got involved as the beginning of this year in what we call now the Arab Spring, was a mixture of a rise. The rise essentially, in my sense, is the rise of civil society. And I just made the point that the Muslim Brotherhood and the Islamists have tried before and failed. And the liberal Democrats, you know, NGOs or what have you, also tried before they ended up in prison, exile, or beyond. So what happened this time differently, for example, at least in Egypt, if we take it as an example quickly, is that in the first few days of that revolt, what did we have? We had a Facebook with 85,000 hits that was not, you know, omnipresent in Syria or in Egypt in the 80s. And the first thousands of people who took to the streets were people from the Facebook. And already by saying Facebook, you're putting your face in front of the threat. That's different. 
Now, when civil society in Egypt, if I'm going to do a quick 30 seconds of my, microcosm analysis, those who took to the streets first were middle class, were labor unions, were all sorts of popular organizations, and it's only at the end of that week that the Muslim Brotherhood were in the back. It's like a few divisions sitting in the back and negotiating among their own leadership, should we go in or not, should we send the students in or not. Of course they know that this was a window, an opening. And the alignment of planets that most analysts are looking at in Egypt is the fact that the international community, because of the visibility of what was happening, including in the United States and Europe, could not ignore it. So it's true that the U.S. and the West actually told Mubarak not to send in the armed forces. That opened the window to the armed forces, basically, to become the strongest element. Now, when the Tahrir Square revolt continued for a few more weeks, the equation was very simple. It was the armed forces, as Dr. Pines has mentioned, that decided that it's time for Mubarak to go. But they couldn't have done it before. So it could have been a pure coup had they rolled their tanks into the palace. It fa in fact, it was a sort of a coup mounted on a revolt which did not become a revolution. Because the Muslim Brotherhood immediately took to the streets are the most organized, although numerically are lesser than the wider society. So let me move up immediately from the micro-analysis and then project this into the other places without going into the details. Same goes for Tunisia with different measurements. The army flipped, but only after the civil society rose. Libya, I agree that the beginning was demonstrations, but those demonstrations immediately turned into, as was said, civil war. But quickly also, one would have to mention that the most organized in Libya, and I am making this statement because in Washington and in Brussels, there's always the question, we don't know them. Well, we, do, we know a little bit more about them. It's not that we don't know them. We know those forces. And, and we don't need sky news. We have Al Jazeera that goes in every day, every hour, interview every single one of the commanders. And by now, even you know, respectable networks are calling them Islamists. By yesterday, the day before yesterday on BBC, they were called Islamist uh, forces. So, yes, in Libya, the dominant force on the ground, other than the bureaucrats and the former diplomats who are the TNC leaders, are basically the Islamist militias on the ground. And we could discuss what would be the projections for Libya later. Syria, I would surmise, is the same type of equation with different dimensions. The Muslim Brotherhood certainly are the most organized, but they're not alone. In the 80s, yes, they were the only ones that were repressed. Now, they are with others. How would that move? It will also be linked to the, how much the Iranians and Hezbollah will, will, will support this, uh, this, uh, this regime. I wouldn't visit Turkey because it has been covered uh, you know, significantly. I would just mention that in the final analysis, the Islamists may, at some point in time, depending on how the West is going to move. That's a very important component that could change things. If the West, led by the United States, is going to partner, and I underline partner, and I will explain it later, with the Muslim world, considering them as the new occupants of the region, then they will take over. They have everything with them. If we're going to release the funds of the G20, the $40 billion, to the forthcoming governments in those places, of course, it's going to be the Muslim Brotherhood uh, takeover. My projection is, if that is the case, you're going to get Islamic Islamists, governments, and states. But you're going to also get a renewal of a second wave of civil society rights, meaning, unlike in Iran in 1979, where the Khomeinis took over and then there was another many decades before the Green Revolution would move up again, I do project that if the Islamists will take and seize because they are under international scrutiny, I think that civil society would rise against them. That would be not for the next weeks, for the next months, but people are tired of authoritarians. And even if the Muslim Brotherhoods or their cousins in the region are going to try to tighten and do a Taliban by the soft way, they would, they would face uh, with, off with civil society. If the West does something else, which I don't see happening in the next couple of years, that is to partner with civil society forces uh, in the region, then they may be a shot at an interim time whereby those civil society forces and the Muslim Brotherhood will vie democratically and politically and may move the region into what I call mediocre democracies. What we may move into if we don't have civil society is non-democracies. So the choice, and I conclude, is going to be non-democracies or mediocre democracies. Thank you. Um, 
those who studied in the West, I mean, many of the leading jihadi ideologues spent a lot of time in the West. But there is something ironic that those leading liberal or anti-jihadists have studied in the East. So, you know, uh, Beirut universities, Cairo universities produced many people who ended up in jail because they were rising again. So studying in the West is not anymore the, 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 the measurement. But I take your point completely. Um, in Washington and in Brussels, let's say in the West in general, uh, we do have at least two camps when they look at those uprisings and try to analyze them. Uh, we have the over-optimistic but little informed <laughs> elites who are, you know, looking at the Islamist Muslim Brotherhood-led movements and thinking that these are the liberals. I mean, outside this or a few other think tanks in town here, you know, that most think tanks now think, that's why they call it the Arab Spring, that the Muslim Brotherhood are the revivalists. And that's why they are advising actually the administration, many members of Congress, and many other governments in Europe, that yes, this is an Arab Spring, simply because the Islamists, and I must, have, I must say this, are very good, their strategists are very good at showing in the beginning of the uprising, oh, we're going to the Adudiyya, pluralism and democracy, that's why it was mentioned in Libya, uh, that when the cameras were on, the organization, the Islamist organization was so disciplined, that they imagine across Libya they had the same narrative. I mean, it's, what does that mean? They never said anything beyond Nahmatullah, we the revolutionaries, until they took Tripoli. The next day, uh, Belhaj, the head commander of the military council in Tripoli, an Islamist leader, a jihadist leader, said, I wouldn't go in any other direction than implementing Sharia law. So he came back to what he was. So things are not happening on their own. There is a very organized force, and that organized force is not just on the ground. It has a world of ideas, capacity. So we need to have a, you know, a better view on, on, on that side of the Arab Spring. But there is another camp in the West, and I, I will have to, to, uh, you know, to, to make a point here, that thinks that the Middle East really has not produced yet liberal and democratic forces and with which I disagree. Those forces exist, they have not been successful, and there's a big difference. Uh, in Poland, you had the uh, Solidarity Movement. Well, Solidarity Movement alone, against the might <coughs> of the communists and of the Soviet occupation, you know, it took many, many years. It took the collapse of the Soviet Union. So, we could go back and forth. I am more optimistic in terms of reading the map. Those forces exist. I am pessimistic on the forces that exist in the West with regard to those issues. And here I join my, my colleague in, in, in stating that the elites who are, which are shaping foreign policy on behalf of the West, on the one hand are ignoring even those small-sized liberal democratic forces of all time, and an oversizing the Islamist forces and presenting them as the actual uh, alternative. So now if you look at one society, an average society, in the Middle East, where there has been political bodies before, you would see that, yes, somewhere between 5 to 15 percent are impacted by any Islamist kind of approach, or Hadi, Muslim Brotherhood, Dio Bandi, or, or Khomeini, and other. But 15 percent is huge. 15 percent could put you on the Tahrir Square, I got you the, the, the date, July 29. July 29, 1 million almost, 700,000 to 1 million Muslim Brotherhood and Salafists showed up. Why did they show up? Because basically that was the day they said it's going to go in our direction. And you've got to listen to the liberals and the anti-Islamists in Egypt complaining, but they're not organized. So you've got 5 to 10 percent of very much organized, and then maybe somewhere around 5 percent of organized labor unions, and actually disorganized labor unions and liberals and what have you, who by the way are not very clear as to how to move forward. And in between you have a large mass and the large mass of people, yes, when the Islamists would ring the bell, the ear is there. So the political culture has not yet moved in one direction, but I would say it all depends on how we in the international community we're going to act. If we have one or the other, it's going to shorten or make it longer for democratic forces to go up in, in, in that debate. Um, there's no doubt about it and maybe other members of the panel will discuss the, the national security implication and the importance of dealing with the, with the regime on, on other grounds, nuclear and terrorism. I'll just address the issue of 
democratic or revolutionary movement in Iran. And I would say what the United States and its allies around the world and even many other players in the international community needs to do is exactly the opposite of what we are doing or not doing now. That would give you the agenda. And it doesn't mean only this administration, even the, the last few years of the previous administration, so I don't make any differences in the sense that, to, first of all, recognize and identify the opposition in Iran, the multiple type of opposition in Iran as a legitimate player. They, they don't exist in our books, we don't receive them in the White House, we don't receive them in the State Department in a way that is official, as we should do. Number two is to give them full support. And I am sure that all of us remember in June 2009 how we actually missed the boat, huge boat, 1.5 million people on the streets, and we said we are not going to meddle. And we are meddling all over the Arab Spring with F-16s, and, and I agree we shouldn't be doing, the, be in the business of, of military interventions at all in Iran, and you may know better than I do, but to have an official U.S. policy of partnering with civil society in Iran. There are plenty of exiled forces. So the whole map should be different in the sense that Supporting the rise of Iranian civil society, including its ethnic minorities, is probably the best way to even respond not just to the principle of helping the Iranians to change, but for our own national security. It merges national security and our values should be seen as one policy in supporting the opposition.